start with a show of hands. Raise your hand if you grew up in a suburb, any suburb. Now, raise your hand if you still live in a suburb. That change is what I'm here to talk about today. Our suburbs, that uniquely American way of life, symbolized by a house, a lawn, a car, a couple kids, no longer holds the totally central place in our culture that it once did. I spent the last two years studying the suburbs. I'm not kidding. And <laughs> I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people about what they thought about their suburban experience today. I thought I would start by just sharing a little bit of what they said. I slowly realized it was not the life I wanted to lead. That was from a mother of four outside of Boston. We're only here until the kids are done with school. That was from a parent in Philadelphia. Congrats on the book. I live in a sterile, superficial suburb after having lived in Chelsea for 12 years, and I'm dying slowly, one day at a time. <laughs> Talk soon, Rob. <laughs> How did we get here? This is supposed to be the American dream, aspired to the world over. Answering that question led me to write this book, The End of the Suburbs. Before you start throwing tomatoes at me, let me just say, this is the house I grew up in. I am a proud product of suburbia. And let me just also say that a lot of the changes that this idea brings are not so bad, even if you live in a suburb today. One of the biggest changes that's happening is this vast movement to urbanize our suburbs and to make them better places to live, and actually to create an almost third way, so that we'll have not just city and suburb, but city and suburb and something in between. We're in the middle of a major transformation of how and where we want to live, and that in the future, the American dream might look a little bit more like this, or like this. To understand all these changes, it helps to understand how the suburbs have evolved. The American suburbs were a really fantastic idea when they were born, but they started out as one thing, and they morphed into something else. Talking about it through the lens of popular culture, they started out like the suburbs we all know from the show The Wonder Years, sepia-toned memories, kids playing in the streets and everything. And they ended up more like the suburbs in Weeds. <laughs> <laughs> the Showtime series, that focuses more on the more modern cookie-cutter kind of suburb, the subdivision plus strip mall model, where, as the theme song cheerfully declares, everything all looks just the same. That was the model that we decided to supersize, commoditize, and cut and paste across our landscape. And then, of course, it all went on steroids during the housing boom, as everybody knows. To put it another way, through another television reference, the modern American suburbs basically jumped the shark. This arrangement pattern has led to a number of uh, negative consequences, not the least of which is really long commutes and really bad traffic. Nobody needs a lesson on why this is bad or not fun, but in recent years, morning television news stations have started to bump up their first broadcast from 6 to 5 to 4.30, reflecting how early people have to get on the road. I talked to a lot of people about their commutes, and the worst story I heard came from Southern California, I talked to a woman who was a teacher in Orange County, and she moved with her husband to a town called Temecula that was 62 miles away. To get to her classroom on time, she had to set her alarm for 3.50 in the morning, leave her house at 4 in sweatpants, only at that hour was she guaranteed to arrive at school at 5.15 in the morning, and then she would go back to sleep under her desk. She told me... <laughs> She said, I felt like George Costanza, referring to the famous Seinfeld episode where George take, takes naps under his desk. Another problem with this arrangement pattern is that it puts people really far away from each other. I spoke to a woman outside of Chicago who had a 6,000-square-foot mansion, circular driveway, three-car garage, the whole deal. And she said that in 10 years, she suddenly realized that she had never once set foot in any of her neighbor's kitchens. In another community in New Jersey, the houses are so far apart that it makes trick-or-treating really hard on Halloween. The parents are worried that the kids are going to get exhausted, it would be not safe, there's no sidewalks. The kids would never get enough candy at that kind of density level to be happy. <laughs> so instead, the parents decided to have everybody drive to the local K-8 to school, park their cars in tailgate formation, and the kids trick-or-treated from car to car. <laughs> they loved it. The parents drank wine, they decorated their cars. <laughs> the kids got tons of candy. But it just goes to show you how far we've come from organic, natural communities that we have to build them out of cars. You can see a lot of this dissatisfaction on Twitter. 
When you search for the hashtag, I hate the suburbs, you get a mountain of colorful material, including this Twitter feed called cul de sac from a woman who tweets out of Charlotte, North Carolina. When you search for the hashtag, I love the suburbs, you get nothing, zero. <laughs> Every now and then you'll get one tweet, but that's it. When you Google suburbia is, This is what Google generates for you. Suburbia is hell, suburbia is boring, suburbia is dead. This is not me. This is Google's robots helpfully giving you an assist by suggesting what so many other people have said. Enough with the bad, there's some really good news happening. And that is that builders and developers and the people that plan the places we live are listening to all these problems and they're trying to come up with solutions. There's a vast movement underway to urbanize or downtownify the suburbs. It's happening all over the place. This is a suburb not far from here called Kentlands in Gaithersburg, Maryland. It's a suburb that was carefully designed to bring elements of urbanism into the suburbs. It has a mixture of townhouses and regular houses. It has a downtown. It has lots of places to gather. Somebody said it's almost as if Georgetown was cut and pasted and dropped into suburbia, and that's what it feels like. This community has also done well financially since it opened in 1993. But for a long time, there weren't that many of these kinds of communities. You had two choices when you had to choose where to live in this country. You could live in a cul-de-sac, you could live in a big city, and there was very little in between, and that's what's starting to change. This is a community outside of Chicago in Libertyville. It's called School Street. The developer, John McClendon, used to build sprawl for many years, and a few years ago, he decided that people might want something more like this. So he built this community, 26 single-family homes with sidewalks and porches and where people can walk to the main street right nearby. Within 18 months, he sold the entire community out, and this was in the depths of the financial crisis. The local press called it an aberration. He's now doing similar modeled communities in Skokie, Illinois, in Steamboat, Colorado, and he's building a massive project for the Mormon Church in Utah, 800 to 1,000 homes. Big builders are doing this too. This is Toll Brothers, this is Pulte Homes. Some of these communities are springing up from the ashes of dead or dying shopping malls, which we have a lot of these days. There's a website that tracks them called deadmalls.com. <laughs> this is Belmar, a community in Colorado that is now where JCPenney once was, 1,100 condos, apartments, studios, and a bunch of restaurants and uh, pedestrian promenade and, and everything. In Atlanta, this is even happening. Atlanta is also known as Sprawlanta. But here's a community there where people are trading in their 35-mile commutes for something different. One guy moved to this community and said that within six months he lost 10 pounds just because he wasn't driving as much, he was walking more. You can really see the void that these developers are trying to fill in the words and phrases that they use when they market these communities. They talk about the exciting Main Street environment and the carefully designed streetscape. They brag that you can leave the car keys at home. They talk about these things the way not so long ago they would have been talking about a three-story foyer. This is Bradley Cooper in Silver Linings Playbook. This movie was filmed and shot in part in a community called Drexel Hill, which is an inner ring suburb outside of Philadelphia. Happens to be where my father grew up. But it's also a great example of how the older suburbs, the old blueprint that we used to build our suburbs worked really well. And this is the thing that these new developers are trying to replicate. If you remember from the movie, the houses were old and charming, but they were close together. There were sidewalks. The, the characters could walk everywhere. They could walk to the movie where they got into the big fight. They could walk to the diner where they had a date. Everything was right there, and a lot of people think these kinds of suburbs are really well positioned for the future, especially with millennials who are the next generation of home buyers and who really like to be near where the action is. You can call them urban burbs or silver linings playbook burbs or vintage burbs. The New York Times earlier this year did a big story proclaiming these very places the wave of the future, and it called them hipsterbia. I grew up in a hipsterbia. This is Media, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb southwest of Philadelphia. But it has a lot of ingredients that you don't really find in suburbs anymore. It has a trolley, it has a courthouse, it has a lively main street. There's bars on that street that are open until 1 or 2 a.m. It has a restored vaudeville theater. This is Media on Wednesday nights in the summertime when they hold Dining Under the Stars. So they close Main Street to traffic, and all of the restaurant owners put chairs and tables out front, and hundreds and hundreds of people come to this. It's incredible. This is not what conventional suburbia looks like on Wednesday nights in the summertime, but this is 
what urban burbs can look like on Wednesday nights in the summertime. And this is what people want. This is what we're going to see more of. This whole urbanization movement is alive and well in our cities as well. You need only to walk outside the door to see a thriving, prosperous Washington, D.C. that's booming right now, and so many of our other cities are. But something else is happening to our cities as well, and that is that just as our suburbs are starting to become more urban, our cities are almost becoming suburbs. What do I mean by that? Cities have more parks, greenery, open spaces than they ever had before. This is the High Line in New York City. They're brimming with young families. This is Philadelphia. In New York, where I live, the neighborhood Tribeca now has so many strollers, it's called Triburbia. There are cineplexes and malls galore in our big cities. I work at Fortune magazine, and we always like to track the moves of big business to tell us what's really happening with our society. And sure enough, all of these giant suburban corporate icons, Walgreen, Walmart, Target, Michaels, the craft store, are, are rushing into cities and developing new format stores for them. One of the most interesting suburban to urban migrations that's happening right now is that of Toll Brothers, which everybody knows Toll Brothers. It's the giant home builder that rose to fame on the wings of the luxury suburban mega home. It built thousands of these homes. This is one of Toll Brothers' latest projects. This is in the industrial chic neighborhood of Dumbo in Brooklyn. This is another Toll Brothers project. This is a skyscraper, 40 stories. When it's done, it's going to alter the lower Manhattan skyline. Toll Brothers, all told, has 30 buildings either open or in the works in New York City. The CEO of Toll Brothers, when I spoke to him about this, told me he never thought they would be building that building on Park Avenue South. He never thought they would have a penthouse for sale for $20 million, but they do. This is all part of a changing portfolio for Toll Brothers. This is a company whose bread and butter, 70 to 80 percent of its revenues, used to be big suburban homes. And that's now more like 50 percent of its business, with the rest made up of other things, big city condos, urban burbs, a whole bunch of other things we probably haven't seen yet. Toll Brothers' shift is really emblematic about a broader shift that's happening in our landscape in general. Jane Jacobs, the legendary urbanist, once said that the suburbs would one day go out of fashion. It's kind of funny to think about suburbs like that, like shoulder pads or Uggs. But it's not overstating things to say that that's actually what's happening. I realize that's a really controversial thing to say, but the truth is it's only the end of the suburbs as we know them, and it's the start of something much bigger, which is more options. For a long time, we had this kind of binary housing landscape. You could live in a city, you could live in a suburb. But now, you have all this whole menu of other options that's coming. You can still live in a, big, in a big house in the suburbs if you want. I still wear my Uggs. Shoulder pads, not so much. But you can also have all these other things. You can have an old-school hipsterbia burb. You can have a brand-new urbanized burb. You can have a house in a family-friendly city. This multiple-choice, choose-your-own-adventure housing market is what's been missing from our landscape for so long. And it's really the start of something new and exciting when it concerns one of the most important decisions that all of us will make, which is how and where we want to live. It also signifies something different, which is the arrival of a new American dream. More specifically, multiple American dreams for multiple American dreamers. I want to urge you all, when you go back to your communities, to pay attention to this. Look for changes in your neighborhood. Look for what's being built, what's going up in vacant retail spaces. These changes are big, they're important, they're happening now, and if you haven't seen them yet, they're coming soon to a neighborhood near you. Thank you very much.